Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Nobles, and I'm the Keenan Sahin Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, and a faculty member in the Department of Political Science here at MIT. It is my honor to serve as both the session chair and as a participant in this afternoon's panel discussion, The Consequences, Intelligence, and Society. Led by our moderator, whom I will introduce in a moment, we are going to explore the human consequences of research on human and machine intelligence. What does it mean for us to build machines that can think? What are the social, economic, political, artistic, ethical, and spiritual consequences of trying to make what happens in our minds happen in a machine? Who does this machine answer to? How do we ensure that the results of our efforts act as moral agents in society? Answering these questions responsibly means first backing up a little. What does it really mean to think? What is intelligence anyway? Philosophers and social scientists and artists have been grappling with these questions for centuries. But today, these questions are being asked in a different context. We are on the verge of incorporating incredibly sophisticated tools for autonomy, prediction, analysis, and sensing into devices and environments that are as intimate to our daily experiences as our own clothing. These questions, in other words, are moving very rapidly out of a theoretical or speculative domain. They are headed directly into our lives and how we live them. Given the variety of perspectives and backgrounds of my fellow panelists and of the questions that we are about to address, I'm going to stop here. I want to hear what they have to say about where we are going and what it means to get there. So, in alphabetical order, and I'm just going to ask them to wave when I say their names, allow me to introduce the people seated, seated on the stage. Daron Asamoglu is the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics at MIT and a member of the, institu of the institutions, organizations, and growth program at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. He earned a BA from the University of York, an MS in Mathematical Economics and econo Econometrics from the London School of Economics, and a PhD in Economics from the London School of Economics. Rodney Brooks is the Panasonic Professor of Robotics Emeritus at MIT, where he, was direct, where he was director of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory until 2007. He was co-founder, chief technology officer, and chairman of iRobot, and is currently the founder, chief te technology officer, and chairman of Rethink Robotics. Dario Guild is vice president of AI and quantum computing at, M at IBM. He's responsible for IBM's global artificial intelligence research efforts and their quantum computing program. He has also helped launch and co-chairs the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Dario earned an SM and PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. Joy Ito is the director of the MIT Media Lab, recognized for his work as an activist, entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and advocate of emergent democracy, <coughs> privacy, and internet freedom. Joy is currently exploring how radical new approaches to science and technology can transform society. Our moderator, Gideon Litchfield, has been the editor-in-chief of MIT Technology Review since December 2017. He spent 16 years at the, Econom at the Economist as a science and technology writer, and in 2012 became one of the founding editors of Quartz. Gideon has taught uh, journalism at New York University and has been a fellow at Data and Society, a research institute devoted to studying the social impacts of technology. Finally, Megan Smith served as the third United States Chief Technology Officer and assistant to the President under President Obama. Prior to her White House role, Megan was a Vice President at Google, Google uh, leading new business development for nine years and later serving as a Vice President on the leadership team at Google X. She recently started a new company, Shift7. She earned an SM, uh, SB and SM in Mechanical Engineering from MIT and is a member of the MIT Corporation and the MIT Media Lab Visiting Committee. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, as Melissa told us, we are going to examine some small questions today. Um, 
in uh, the 45 minutes or so that remain to us. Um, and there is enough intellectual firepower on this stage to sink a battleship, let alone a journalist. So I am going to try my best to stay out of the way and guide this discussion loosely. But on the whole, this should be a conversation between these brilliant people uh, about the questions of technology and AI uh, that Melissa outlined. In the morning sessions, we heard a lot about the benefits of, uh, of AI, machine intelligence, and how uh, it can be used to benefit society. So we heard about social robots that can help children to learn, about uh, using uh, algorithms to, cure, pr to predict cancer and also to cure it, uh, predicting falls uh, when elderly people are moving around by themselves, the, the, the risk of them falling, detecting when they fall, using Wi-Fi signals for that, using Wi-Fi signals also to analyze sleep patterns, um, creating algorithms to uh, build personalized investment schemes for people so they don't get suckered by people like Bernie Madoff. Um, so there are some wonderful, wonderful things that machine intelligence can do for us. But of course, like any very powerful technology, it has its dark side and its potential for abuse. Um, I think that this audience is probably familiar with a lot of the social issues and risks around AI. So I'm just going to do very, very high-level brief thumbnail sketches of some of the main ones and then turn it over to the panel for the discussion. So one of the most familiar items, of course, is jobs, the future of work, the effects of automation, and what that will do to our economies. Um, algorithmic bias is a topic that has gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, the ways in which uh, the algorithms we build and the data, more importantly, the data that they are trained on, may encode biases that already existed in our society um, uh, that then just get re reproduced. So for example, uh, the algorithms that uh, give people criminal risk scores uh, on the, the, the risk of them, re of, of them re offending and that turn out to have biases uh, that give inaccurate scores more often to African Americans than to white Americans. Um, the issue of differential pricing of ads on Facebook recently got a lot of attention. Uh, so the, the ways in which pricing mechanisms that are invisible to us most of the time can have all sorts of political consequences. Um, the power of the tech giants, I mean, and a handful of very large companies, particularly in the US and increasingly in China, uh, have the dominant, uh, dominant power over much of the data that is being collected and the algorithms that that data is used for. And that means that a handful of these companies are effectively creating frameworks and dictating policy um, that affects the whole of the world. Uh, what do we do about the power of those tech giants? There is unequal access to technology. So one of the issues that uh, uh, this rise, uh, arises in is, uh, was highlighted in a report recently by Data and Society, an institute where I was a fellow, uh, on precision medicine. The issue there being that we are increasingly developing forms of medical treatment, algorithmically based, that can create personalized treatment, treatments for you based on data analysis. But the problem is, of course, those treatments are much more likely to be accessible to people in certain areas, uh, people who are technologically savvy, who are health literate. And uh, if those treatments are, tra are developed on the basis of data from those sorts of people, then the data they contain will be biased, and they may work better for some people than for others. The use of uh, surveillance um, and other, let's just say, creepy technologies that are enabled by AI. Uh, the generation of fake news, the ability to manipulate media. Uh, the inadvertent uh, echo chambers that arise from our use of social media. Um, the use of, of uh, machine intelligence for criminal ends, such as the recent report by uh, the OpenAI Foundation, which looked at how, uh, uh, there, uh, how AI may be used to uh, make uh, things like phishing scams operate on a much larger scale. And then finally, um, the is an issue that faces a lot of us, device addiction. Um, uh, our devices and the, the websites and apps that we use are already designed to capture as much of our attention as possible. AI makes them even better at that and even harder for us to control how we use our time. So these are familiar issues, I think, to most people. Um, it feels as if they've gotten more attention uh, recently. There have been books like uh, Kathy O'Neill's uh, Weapons of Math Destruction, Virginia Eubanks' Automating Inequality, Safia Noble's uh, Algorithms of Oppression, um, there are NGOs such as the Center of Humane Technology, which deals with this, specifically with this issue of device addiction. Um, there are technology ethics courses now appearing at MIT and Harvard, at Stanford, at NYU, and elsewhere. So 
it seems as if there is, there is increasing, at least in public and in academia and in research and among activists, increasing recognition of a lot of these issues. And the, so my first question to you as members of the panel is, you're all well connected in industry and in, the, in policy circles. What are the conversations that are happening there? Uh, how, are, how are these issues percolating into there and what sorts of solutions are people beginning to discuss for some of these issues? Anyone who wants to jump in? Can I do one framing question? Because I think there's the fear and risk of superintelligence, and a lot of the presentations are sort of the, the future of AI, which is sort of generally what we call whatever we can't yet explain. And there's stupid intelligence, which is sort of, just take automation. Um, actually, Norbert Wiener, who was a famous MIT mathematician, uh, in his uh, book, The Human Use of Human Beings, uh, he calls institutions machines of flesh and blood. And so the idea that automation, and any rule, any bureaucracy is a form of automation. And if you look at the markets, they're sort of not under control. And they have certain sort of evolutionary systems that cause injustices and harm. And we have trouble regulating and controlling these complex self-adaptive systems like MIT, like, like the, the markets. And so some of the problems of automation aren't actually new. And I think there's also this sort of framing of AI as this sort of other thing. I know Rod and Rodney use this sort of networks connecting to each other. And, I, and at the Media Lab, we use the term extended intelligence rather than an artificial intelligence. So, so I think there's some new problems, but there are a lot of good old fashioned problems, which are just complex self-adaptive systems that are evolving in a sort of uncontrolled and harmful way. And people like Donella Meadows and Jay Forrester modeled these complex systems and we're trying to suggest how we might intervene, but those problems are actually quite similar. So, so I think there's some really interesting new problems and in some of the uh, reinforcing of biases through algorithms also are new, but the fact is that the systemic biases that exist exist because of these automated systems that have reinforced biases. So, so again, I, I just wanna caution that it's not all brand new stuff, it's just that we have boosted rockets on yeah. these systems, causing them to be harder to control. Yeah, I think that Joey makes a really good point, which is now we're gonna take them exponential. So you said might introduce bias, they already are introducing extraordinary bias uh, across the board. And, and so, you know, the systems that we live in, these human systems, they accelerate some people. You know, I think sort of the, the captains of Silicon Valley, if you think Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, the different people, they plus the system created them and others who were like them who didn't look like that, maybe they were different gender or race or age or whatever, they got decelerated by the system. And now we're gonna add this you know, at exponential level, right? So one of my favorite ones, we don't have visuals, but polygraph.cool shows you who speaks in film. And it turns out uh, in children's television, it's 15 to one boy programmers to girl programmers who are cast. So we teach children propaganda that boys do this, girls don't. And if you look at the visuals, it's, it's sort of 80 to 20, or even worse, of who speaks. So do we want to train on that data set so right. that men are going to speak and women aren't? That's not the world we want to do. So you know, it, it's a really interesting time of trying to be more mindful, especially it's so exciting that, by the way, it's so exciting that MIT is doing this. And I think that our opportunity as very thoughtful cross-functional folks is really step into the world. I love MIT Solve, it's reaching out to really think through what do we hope for and put our values as well as what we already do into the system and really pay mindful attention to that as we step into this design. And even then, it's gonna be incredibly hard. So if this, as Joey says, if this is an acceleration of stuff that has been going on for a while, is there anything that we've learned already from the past, I don't know, 30 years or whatever, whatever time frame you wanna put it, on what works as a way to prevent biases from creeping in and getting stuck in the system? Well, I think the one element of it was that, or a contrast to the reality we face today with some of the modern machine learning techniques, is the degree to which you know, processes or programs we created could be inspected by others and be understood by others. So to the extent that, let's say, you were doing a credit scoring uh, program or deciding who should get credit, um, to the extent that you were writing a set of rules before, right, and you were using a protected variable, Right, that you shouldn't have used and it was illegal to use. Um, and you had a process a for- variable being like race, for instance. Race or gender or something. 
And uh, as a result of that, somebody was inspecting the program, you would see, you can't do this, right? This is illegal and so on. Now, if somebody just takes past data, historical data that you've had and you know, trains a simple machine learning model to be able to do this classification, and that becomes a bit more opaque in that, then how does it happen? How do you debug it? Are you doing something illegal? Are you doing something that's not right? So that is a difference from sort of past behaviors, but the prior data that was being used as an example to train and validate may have been biased in both cases. Can I right. jump in for one sec here? So if you look at the, and, and uh, there, I want to be careful speaking in front of a professional, but if you look at the history of racism, you have like slavery, Jim Crow, and now you have this colorblind racism. And similarly, you can't use race in risk scores, but you have all these proxies for race. That's and true. even if we identify the proxies, the machine will find it. So there was a Spotlight article from last year that showed that the median uh, asset uh, ownership of uh, African Americans in Boston is $8, and white people is $247,000. So if you have an accurate prediction of who you want to give mortgages to, you're just going to reinforce it. And so this is one of the things, and this ties to this point that you made about Julie Angwin's thing. So if you're trying to get very accurate assessment of recidivism, um, you're going to get unfair false positives. And if you tune for fair false positives, you get inaccurate recidivism rates. And the other thing is the input to the recidivism rate is actually arrests. And arrests correlate more with policing than they do with yeah, crime. Okay. Most homicides are not actually turned into um, convictions. And so crime doesn't correlate with arrests, but arrests are input, and then arrests are correlated with low-income neighborhood and so on. So the tricky part about transparency is that the machine will figure out its way to continue to disadvantage, disadvantage people. And, and, the, and this is the, the point I, we're trying to make at the Media Lab is um, we worship prediction and accuracy, but prediction and accuracy isn't fair when the system is unfair. And so That's what right. you want to do is you want to go for causal inference to look for the underlying causes and try to treat that rather than more accurately doing criminal justice and prediction and, and policing. And so, so I think that's the problem is you, we already have a system that's sort of broken. And if we just look for clean, pure, transparent accuracy, it's still going to be unfair. So that is a way then of doing what Megan was suggesting, which is how do we infuse the values that we want into the algorithm? It's by changing what the goal of the algorithm is. Instead of trying to predict more accurately, it should look for the causal well, One thing is it's March 1st, which is I call Women's Missing History Month. So uh, we had, you guys did this incredible work in, in the humanities department with MIT and slavery, and thank sure. you, Raphael, mm -hmm. uh, and leadership of MIT and your leadership, Melissa, to do that. Yeah. Um, it's notable to mention Ida B. Wells. How many people in this audience have ever heard of Ida B. Wells? She's one of the greatest American data scientists in the history of our country. And so in the late 1800s, she used data to measure what we were doing and really slowed us and slowed us and stopped us from lynching people. She's really hashtag Black Lives Matter uh, data scientist and an extremely talented journalist. And so, but the reality of what happened to her, if you know your history, is she and Frederick Douglass protested the Chicago World's Fair. You know, I love Tesla and Edison and their fight, and that's so known from the fair, right? Tesla demoed, and I'm from Buffalo where he lit Niagara Falls. Uh, or use Niagara Falls to light Buffalo. But he got to demo and be all that, and all of us know his name. Frederick and Ida protested the fair because they were not allowed, African American people were not allowed to demonstrate all of their inventions and uh, art and everything. And so the truth, China led to the truth, you know, and how would it be we at MIT if Ida had been able to do her incredible data science work on justice? Would there be presenters on this stage who've been building for a century? on her work on machine learning now around data science and justice the way that you are, and Ida would be known to all of us, and it would be a different, different truth. You know, my view on this is, you know, thinking about it as the dean of the School of Humanities Arts and Social Sciences, the ways in which all of this great knowledge that is, is being created still needs to be rooted in the old stuff, right? So we're not, in a way, it further re reinforces the need for knowledge about 
political science, history, literature, even as we begin to do all these incredible technological changes, in part because we don't want to amplify, as you all are saying, all of the inequalities, and we still have just basic work that needs to be done, and students need, as, a, as an educational matter, as, as part of our educational mission, need to be able to understand and contextualize these things, and that can only come through. So I, this is music to my ears. I didn't think being on this panel, I'd be hearing this and making me so happy. But when you, when you say I students, imagine all these kids are going to take these classes now. Yes. And so you're saying specifically engineering technology students. They Correct. need the historical and political and everything else. Right, precisely, right. right. Even more around. than ever, in certain ways, um, uh, this uh, maybe will do the work that, we, you know, uh, that we've been trying to do for years, which is to reinforce the importance of it. But it, it may be now that it's indispensable. Right, that in order to really do this, you need to know it. So. And I have two philosophy students sure. in my AI and ethics class, right. so, exactly so it goes right. both ways. Yeah. Right. Cook, exactly right, of course. Tim yeah. Cook's commencement address specifically addressed this to the MIT students last year, Correct. saying, you know, don't leave the room. Uh, you know, you've got your engineering issues, but when we get to privacy and humanities, social science, uh, engineering sciences all together. The universe doesn't separate the subjects, but we ring bells between them, and we need right. to stop doing that. So you're saying it's incumbent on institutions like MIT to make sure everyone gets a rounded education. Is it doing that? Yes, I think so. Yes, we are. <laughs> and we, um, <laughs> yeah, of course we are. But, and, and we can always do it better. And uh, so it's precisely these kinds of efforts which are across the institute which will ensure that that happens. All right. <laughs> I'd like to move over to this, the subject of the labor market and automation and jobs because it is one of the biggest topics. Um, uh, and in our discussions before this panel, Daron raised th this issue, which is, can we talk about what is helping, what's working in helping people adapt to the changing labor market? And when, when can machine intelligence actually help people? And when does it hinder them? And, and what do we do about that? I mean, what we've seen, for instance, is I think there were some studies recently showing that simply retraining people who've been displaced from jobs doesn't necessarily help. Uh, in fact, I think in one study, the people who were retrained did worse at finding new work than the people who had not been retrained. I forget the exact context. Um, but so what are, the, what are those circumstances in which it is machine intelligence is helping people overcome uh, the work displacement, if at all? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a very apt that this is called this initiative is called intelligence, because I think that's what we need more of it. So it's looked at it from one simple perspective. I think what we haven't had enough over the last 30 years is enough machine intelligence and enough human intelligence to go with the machine intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I think, I don't think it's possible to create a healthy society that doesn't have jobs for people, both for livelihood reasons and for their roles as social and economic uh, actors in society. But it's also a reality that many, many technologies, not just the recent AI robotics, many, many technologies displace people. A lot of what technology tries to do is reduce costs, and you do that by finding better ways and cheaper ways of doing it, and mostly substitute machines for things that people did before. So that's displacement. What, what happens after displacement? Does that mean that technological change always reduces employment, always reduces jobs and wages? No. And because there is a very powerful countervailing mechanism, which is that when you reduce costs, then you also create jobs in other domains. You create jobs because the sector in which costs are being reduced expands. You produce more cars. But also, other sectors expand. They try to they start doing complementary tasks, complementary activities. So when looked at it from this perspective, the threat to jobs is not you know, what sometimes you read in the newspapers, that those are brilliant technologies that are gonna do everything that humans are going to, are doing at the moment. They are so-so technologies. They're technologies that are just enough to displace people, but they don't really reduce costs all that much. And as a result, the displacement effect is there. We get people out of the tasks that they were performing, but we don't generate all of that dynamism. And if you look at the data, and we can debate the data, there are some people say it's a mismeasurement, et cetera, we've never had it so bad for the last 90 years in terms of productivity growth. This is the dark age of productivity growth. So all of these technological improvements, they're not really translating into productivity growth, either at the sectoral level or at the national level. So what's wrong? And I think there are three things that are wrong. One is that machines are not actually as intelligent as we think they are. And part of that is because they're not really going after perhaps the big thing in terms of economic returns. 
you know, you could do, you could improve, you know, the cat recognition algorithm on the internet, but, you know, how much GDP are you going to get out of that? The second is, you know, we're not exploiting the machine human intelligence. And the way to do that is to create complementarities. That comes both from the machine side and from the human side. You know, we've been here before. The British Industrial Revolution, which is also a landmark of machines replacing humans, you know, we've had 80 years of no wage growth. And wage growth finally came when we started changing the whole system, the education system, uh, the institutions, uh, representation, redistribution, and all of these things. And those are all missing things in the way that we do things, and they are sort of not generating enough of the, uh, the, the machine human intelligence dimension. And, and finally, I think we're also not helping, and again, the British Industrial Revolution is sort of apt here, because we're not sharing the gains, whatever they are, and they're, you know, they're not super high relative to the 1960s or the 70s, but they're still non-trivial. We're not sharing them equally enough, and that creates even more tensions and even more problems in terms of building the human machine intelligence of the future, the productivity gains, and, and also the, the social order, which is going to support all of these things. Right. Yes, yeah. um, I'd, I'd like to talk about job displacement. Unlike you, I'm not an economist, so I'm not constrained by data, <laughs> <laughs> what I talk about here. Um, so, uh, uh, the, the, the intelligence, machine intelligence we have is very narrow. We saw that this morning, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the videos of the young children doing incredible social things and inferring all sorts of stuff and thinking at a very young age. Um, we don't have any of that. Um, in our intelligence, and I think a lot of what gets labeled as artificial intelligence and job displacement from intelligence is really about, uh, we ha now have digital uh, channels through our society, and we exploit those digital channels, and that's how stuff gets deployed. But there are certain places where we are not gonna have digital channels anytime soon, and I think it is gonna have a big uh, change to a lot of jobs. Um, and in particular, we don't have any capability for robots to be able to interact closely with people. Um, so we will uh, be able to sense when someone falls, as we saw this morning. We'll be able to monitor when something's gonna go wrong. But there's an incredible mega trend of a demographic inversion where there's gonna be lots and lots of older people. They will need physical help when they're gonna fall or when something bad has happened, or just to maintain their dignity and independence in the houses. And in the US, uh, throughout the history of the U.S., from pre-colonial days, days, we have uh, relied on low-cost immigrant labor. In the early days, it wasn't immigrants who chose to come here, and uh, uh, but that was where we had uh, labor from. More recently, it's been uh, people who've chosen to come but get exploited, low-cost labor. We decided that's a bad idea. We don't want any more of those people. Um, and it just doesn't work on the world uh, in general, because everyone's getting, is gonna be getting older. So what I see happening is, we'll get all the sort of uh, transactional uh, tasks that uh, people have done as good sort of jobs, and what will be left, we have real demand for physical stuff. Helping old people poop. Helping old people into and out of bed. That is not something, you know, it's gonna be like teaching. We're not gonna value that very well in our society. <laughs> And so there's going to be this incredible demand for what's going to be viewed as low-cost labor with no respect for it. And I think we're going to have to restructure or, you know, I think I'm the oldest one here. You know, it's going to, I'm going to be, you know, <laughs> not able to get out of bed and have no one to help me. And by the time you guys get there, it's going to be much worse. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie, so I'm not an economist either, but doesn't the market solve that demand? If there is that demand, won't won't the price of that kind of work rise? Uh, it, it may, but it certainly hasn't. I don't think it's solved it in the case of teaching in schools in the country. But, but, <laughs> you know, right. well, the but now they're going to get a bonus for being able to I shoot. I think there are, there are two separate points here. I mean, on the first point of the importance of what Rod is saying about bringing robots and uh, various form of more digital intelligence, artificial intelligence, and, and to perform a broad range of tasks, 100%. But, but actually, on the second one, that's both a blessing and a curse. If you look at the US economy over the last 30 years, where have we created jobs? 
We haven't created industrial jobs. We haven't even created a lot of engineering jobs. They Service. come a lot of it at the bottom, very bottom of the distribution, the bottom 25 percentile of occupations in terms of word wages. And that's for two reasons. First of all, a lot of people have lost, lost their jobs in the middle of the wage distribution because of automation, and they've been pushed into that part. And secondly, because those are the jobs that, exactly like Rod says, we haven't found ways of automating them. But that's both a blessing and a curse. You know, if we have no other jobs, those are better, and we've actually seen some wage growth at the bottom of the distribution as a result of that. But, but I think the uh, real promise of machine human intelligence is to go beyond that, create jobs that, ha that are going to be both more higher paying, more pleasant, more satisfying for people, and I think that's quite possible if we sort of take a back uh, step and think about how we can better use these technologies for creating jobs. And can I ask you a question? Um, because you use the word GDP and productivity, and I have a nine-month-old child, and it feels like a service job, but I, that wouldn't go to GDP, right? And I think if I'm a street musician, I'm not contributing to GDP, but I think if I break a window, I do, right? Yes. So, so I'm a little bit curious if, if about... You, if you marry your gardener, it goes into the... Yeah, so, so, so I guess I'm a little bit concerned about using financial metrics from an industrial age of making and building things when most of the stuff that I think is important in society, like spending time with my child, isn't calculated as productivity gain. Whereas if I could spend more time with my child and less time cleaning windows, it feels like a good thing. And, and I think that, um, so I think one of the questions that I have is, is there another way to measure um, things like, because I, I also believe that a lot of the problems with these machines of flesh and blood is we've started since you know the the Reagan period, and then you know more and more becoming a short-term financial returns-oriented society, which I think is aggravating the evolution of these systems. And so I wonder if there's a way to redefine how we measure things so that maybe we can change. And this is the Danella Meadows point, which is when you want to intervene in a complex system, you change the paradigm rather than fiddling with the parameters. Right. Of course. I mean, I totally agree with that. But of course, what you don't want to say is we want to change the metric because we don't like what the previous metric is giving us. <laughs> but uh, I mean, GDP was never meant to be a measure of welfare. And it's not a measure of welfare. We could, we could create a lot of GDP and destroy the environment, which we've been doing. <laughs> and that would be a terrible thing. But GDP is very good for measuring what it does, and especially at the sectoral level. So that's why I mentioned sector and, GD and, and aggregate. So at the aggregate level, a lot of the US economy is services and services. We do a terrible job of measuring quality. But for manufacturing, we know these things. That's much better. We have price indices. It's in manufacturing that we don't see the productivity improvements. We see all of these digital technologies, even robotics, a lot of the numerically controlled machines spread over the last 40 years. And there's very little productivity improvement in US manufacturing, and it's true in other countries also. So uh, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is how do we drive for creative confidence in everybody? right? And so how do we get to a point where people are opting themselves into the thing that they're passionate about doing? Like I have my computer science for all uh, uh, teacher on, which is um, from some stuff that we did in the White House. How about all children in America learn coding? You know, and not because everyone would be a coder. We teach freshman biology, not because everyone's going to be a biologist, but because these are basic literacies of the 21st century. But they also teach confidence, and you build things, design thinking. Having those experiences is, uh, is really important. I think if you talk to each of us, we came into our career because of somebody and something that tapped our passion. And so how do we tap the passion? So I've been actually spent the last, uh, uh, I've been doing many different kinds of projects, but one of them was a tech jobs tour. I've been to 25 different cities uh, across Appalachia, Milwaukee, uh, Birmingham, um, Cleveland, everywhere, and just getting Americans to meet each other because they're sort of techy, creatively confident folks in every town. In Boise, there's <laughs> 15 tech meetups with uh, 800 people in one of them, and no one knows them. And so how do you, people already know how to fish in town and they know where the great fish is. How do you get neighbors to meet each other and live for their own cities um, and do what they would do? And so I've, I've been witnessing that all around and, and seeing that happen. And I think part of the future of work is including everyone and creating structures so people can fix it themselves uh, with the thing that they would love to do uh, and solve and including the vision that you just had about spending time with family being with each other, being in, in the creative arts, or whatever that is. What opportunity do we have? How would we like it to be? But isn't there an assumption there that 
you can just sort of teach creative confidence to anybody and they will pick it up. I mean, I think we on this panel, the people probably in this room, we're privileged and lucky, not least in the fact that something in us allows us to attain that confidence. Maybe it's been taught to us or shown to us by somebody. But nonetheless, we're in a position that we're able to take advantage of that and then go out and do it. And I don't think that's true of everybody. I think some people have you know, grown up in really hard conditions. Yes. Some people just innately incredibly shy or incredibly timid. And it's, it's sort of, I, I fear that what you're saying means that it creates a, a, a new elite class of those who are confident or have an innate confidence and those who are not. But you can, you can define it, just very specifically, you can define <clears throat> confidence in different ways. And we can also make the system adapt. I mean, uh, when Malala Yousafzai was attacked, I went and helped create the Malala Fund because I want Malala to lead us, because she knows much more than I'll ever know. And having worked with her for a while and been all over the world with young people, everyone is talented. Everyone is talented. And I think your point of like the diversity of how we bring that talent, how we want to do that, we need to adapt the system for that. But everyone can bring what they would bring. We have to allow people to work on the things that they would love to work on. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'd like to pick up on one of your points. Does anyone here have one of these things? No. <laughs> um, did any of you have to be trained you know, at a, a six-month community college course on how to use it? <laughs> no. Because what this does is it teaches you how to use it as, as, uh, as you use it. And I think that as technologists, we should be thinking about how we, because I agree, um, every person uh, is, uh, who's able to have any sort of job is smarter than any AI system we have today. So how do we bring out the intelligence in them by having the machines so they don't have to have training or they don't have to have confidence very unconfident people can use these, mm -hmm. but how the technology brings out the best in them, mm -hmm. I think is something that <coughs> uh, Silicon Valley knows how to do in many ways, but the um, uh, motivations for high, high return, um, <coughs> sorry, motivations for fantastic returns doesn't direct it everywhere it needs to be directed. Yeah, well, also, that, connected on, to sorry. that, connected to that, it has to be the notion of purpose. So, yeah. what are we going to use the technology for? Yeah. Um, I think a skew we have in the current system, even in the context of the AI discussion, is very, very skewed towards uh, consumer domain or a consuming orientation, as opposed to an orientation of professions and you know, on your livelihood. <laughs> and to the degree that we can create AI technology that has a different <coughs> set of requirements, by the way, that when you have very massive amounts of data and you can amortize you know, uh, the labeling effort you know, to billion consumers. For most people, whether you have a small business or for large enterprises, the amount of data available is very different. The requirements associated on how you're gonna use the information or needs for security or needs for regulation, depending on the profession. I think by and large, the community at large is not sufficiently focused in the application of AI to that world, to the world of our livelihoods as opposed to the world of our personal time. And if we, one of the things I hope uh, that can happen within the IQ initiative is that we also shift that talent and orientation towards the complementarity that you were alluding to that will ultimately result in the increase in productivity. How will humans and machines collaborate? But that has intent and has purpose. So I, guess I can say, add something. I mean, I think Megan mentioned a very important C word. Confidence is important, but creativity. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that machines will not have, certainly not in my lifetime, in my assessment, is true creativity. But that's where the domain of the complementarity between machines and humans lie. And moreover, machines have the promise of increasing the potential for that creativity. You know, at the end of the 19th century, Oh, over 60% of the US labor force was in agriculture. You know, the conditions were extremely harsh, the schooling available to people was very low. As soon as they could uh, exert physical effort, they were put in the field. The same thing actually in the 70s and the 1980s when the, there's an economic boom in a, in a region, you see people drop out of high school and they go and take manufacturing jobs. You know, it's different when you have machines as mechanization of agriculture showed in, uh, in, in the agricultural domain and now in, in, with robots and, and other technologies in the manufacturing, when there is greater room for people to actually develop their creativity. And a lot of the application of digital technology will give more ability for people to pursue their own sort of uh, interests and their own comparative advantage. So it's actually 
prepares the possibilities for creativity if we develop it the right way. But again, I'm not sure whether the current applications of machine learning, the current applications of these technologies is going in that direction. In right. fact, I would say it's not going in that direction. Exactly. And that's why we do need to step back and think about machine intelligence differently. And, and to be clear, you're talking about encouraging people to develop their creativity so that they can find new employment opportunities. So that they can, and more so they can be who they want to be in the world. Right. So I, I call it creative confidence. It's like hashtag creative okay, confidence. Okay, CC, even yeah. better than my and, uh, <laughs> But to your point, also, when we were in the White House and we did a lot of the work President Obama has to do uh, around uh, AI. We did town halls all over the country with different universities. And uh, it, the main conclusion was that we're not applying, we're, we don't have enough AI. Like we need more AI, much broader on many more topics. And I love uh, like that MIT is doing uh, MIT in the world for a better world. But right? what type of AI? I mean, we can have much more of the Facebook type of AI or yeah. chat recognition AI. That's not going to help with that problem. Exactly. So it's the type and it's the perspective exactly. change, perhaps. So That's broadening right. that and getting more people, a much broader set of people working on it, uh, you know, on the creative side, developing in, in the voice from all the different uh, domains. Okay. On an issue that's tangentially related to this, uh, and I don't need to talk, I just want you to vote. Universal basic income, yes or no? <laughs> um, I don't know. I love experiments. I, I think broadly no, but worth experimenting. Yeah, yeah not yet. <laughs> I love experiments too, but this going, goes in the wrong direction. The problem is creating jobs, so you want to use the redistribution. Definitely a stronger social safety net, more welfare state, but use that just like negative income tax or retraining programs in order to get people into jobs, not encourage them to stay out of it. All right, quick audience poll. If yeah, you no, I agree it, too. I mean, I'm the political oh, scientist. I agree with Apologies. the economist. <laughs> <laughs> you agree with the economist. Okay, quick audience poll. Universal basic income. Raise your hands if you think it's a good idea. Mm. What about experiments? Do you like experimenting? <laughs> Everybody loves yeah, experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hands if you think UBI is We're not a good MIT. idea. <laughs> Raise your hands if you think UBI is not a good idea. Okay, this is basically an audience that has no opinions. <laughs> um, cool. I'd like to. So this also leads us into another question, which I think is comes up a lot, which is what is the role? I mean, essentially, whose responsibility is it to make some of these solutions happen? And in particular, what's the role of government? Um, you know, we see in particular in things like the, the issues of automation and the gig economy um, that our labor laws uh, are out of date for dealing with this new situation. Uh, that our antitrust laws are out of date for dealing with the power of big tech companies. Um, that our you know, privacy laws are out of date for dealing with the, the situation when basically everybody's data is out everywhere and nobody really has privacy anymore. So does it feel to you as if things are moving faster than before and that government is now fundamentally unable to keep up? Or is there something that can be done to keep law and regulation more in line with technological change? I want to say it's not able to keep up, but it's not keeping up. Right. So, uh, you know, two points. Uh, on the economic concentration, absolutely. You know, at the uh, time, the Gilded Age, when people were up in arms about the trusts, you know, the largest five corporations made up less than 6% of US GDP. Today, largest five corporations, 17% in terms of their market capitalization, but we choose to do nothing about it. The second thing is I think Silicon Valley has a lot to sort of recommend in terms of its values, in terms of its sort of freedom and, and, and rebellious nature. But there is also this sort of view of libertarian, you know, everything comes from the business world. And I think that's just not true. If you look at the history of technology in the United States or anywhere, it's a interaction between what the government and what the private sector does. You know, we did not create all of the technologies that were transformative because the market by itself that it was an interaction. So I think it's the same thing today that it, uh, none of the things that we're saying and all of the promise and the creativity uh, of the tech world doesn't mean that the government shouldn't play a role in the, in, 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 in channeling it into a different direction. I think the, in the tech, this may not be clear, but think of the same thing in the in the area of energy. If we let the market do the energy, we will end up with more, more gas guzzlers and more coal power, power plants. But fortunately, you know, that's not what the world is doing to some little degree that we're encouraging clean technology. So it's the same thing that the return for society of all technologies are not the same. So, and to add to that, uh, you know, what's, what's the issue is, 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 is compounded to the degree to which citizens don't have confidence in government, right? So they're losing trust in the ability of government to do its job, and thereby making Silicon Valley and other non-government 
venues or decision-making processes more attractive, but they are not democratic, right? I mean, many of these things that happen in Silicon Valley and such are uh, anti-majoritarian. I mean, it's a small number of people making huge decisions that have big effects. Uh, so we certainly want government involved, right? It's clear that it isn't yet, and it has its basic governance functions which, about which we're losing confidence. And we have a world that's changing so quickly. We need our government to do more, and it's not. So it, we, in, a, in a sense, the political crisis that we are witnessing, it has many ramifications, right? Not merely with uh, day to day, but how we deal with the future. And that's, uh, you know, as a political scientist, I, I find it quite troubling. So that brings me back, I guess, to the question I asked at the beginning, which is in the light of this Increasing trust in government, increasing incapacity of government to deal with some of these issues. What are the conversations that you people are hearing in industry, in the tech industry, about the industry's responsibility slash need to uh, address some of these issues more actively <coughs> itself? Well, I think, first of all, just to tie a little bit, I mean, I think it's interesting to contrast with, say, Germany, which yeah. is a primary, mostly functioning democracy in America, which is a dysfunctional democracy, <laughs> in my view, and the way they're applying it. So, so, so autonomous vehicles, we did this trolley problems thing with, with hundreds, tens of millions of responses, and overall people thought that an, an autonomous vehicle should sac sacrifice the passenger if it's gonna save more lives. But they would never buy that car but everyone else should. So this, is, <laughs> so, so, so this is clearly, the market's not gonna fix that problem. And interestingly, Germany has passed an autonomous vehicle directive or, or a set of guidelines, which is really interesting. And, and the people, you know, so, so, so I think the, the question is to me, and, and Silicon Valley is libertarian, is somewhat mm. sort of part of the problem is that there's, but, but broadly I think people don't trust government here and in some countries. And, and, and I think we can look to the countries where you have functional democracies to see how they are starting to grapple with some of these, these questions um, in, in, in Europe and other places. And I, I think we need to fix democracy right, quickly right. to get to these problems because the market's not gonna solve some of these social problems. There's also one of the things that, um, you, know, being, I, you know, I had the chance, uh, the honor to get to serve the American people and be in government. Uh, one of the things I noticed is that someone has solved just about everything somewhere and no one knows. <laughs> and so using these network channels you're talking about better to better share as community practice, whether it's neighbors like in this tech jobs idea or whether we created a thing called the data-driven data justice because we found things in criminal justice reform. Miami went from 7,000 people in prison to 4,900 closed to jail and saved $12 million. How'd you do that, right? And they had opened a 12-bed stabilization unit. They were routing people with substance abuse and mental health disorder in a different way. And so great solution. Camden, similar, you know, looking at enterprise data, found 205 people cost them 7% of the money, started acting differently. We were able to get a couple cities willing to listen to that, adapt it, copy it, and then we now have 129 cities who talk to each other every two weeks in a community practice, like an open source team might across that. So we can use these networks to much more rapidly share what's working in, in these areas. And so on the specifics of government, I think most government is, as you described, like super dysfunctional all over the world. But there's beautiful pockets, uh, Estonia being the most digital, but uh, uh, different places where people really have solved things. And if we are better at sharing, we could really fix a lot of things faster. So what is the tech industry doing about it? I think they're waking up in some ways. I think there's many things to happen. I, I think that people, you know, the, the beautiful stuff, we are a bunch of engineers and scientists. We try to do, you know, MIT is minds and hands and heart. We do this because of service, we do it because of wonder, we do it because of community, and then stuff got weaponized, right? The, the great things that everybody made got weaponized, and people had to wake up, uh, or they are addicting people. And so now we have to face that reality, look in the mirror, but it's and so not that's just going the, on. Well, so Very it's serious. It's not just the industry. Uh, you know, going back to the first team, you really need the intelligence force both from the humans and the machines. Yes. If our education system is crumbling, you know, and that's a political problem because the reason why it's very hard to fix the education system is not just because we don't know what works, but it's because there will be a lot of resistance from all sorts of quarters, from parents, from teachers, from uh, political forces. So it's so this is where you know the democracy that we need to fix is actually much harder because it needs to tackle all of these sweeping challenges that are cross-cutting, and that's not an easy thing. So it's very. I think if we could solve these problems, it's, it's, it's a very bright world, but the problems we're facing are quite daunting at some level. Listen, do you see any promising signs in terms of the ability of uh, 
people's ability to start solving these problems of democracy? Well, you know, I think uh, at least what's happening here in the U.S., we can begin to look at the states that, are, you know, part of the benefits of federalism is that it allows for experimentation at yeah. the state level and local level. And uh, I, by my mind, that's where a lot of the energy is going to be coming from. And then eventually may make it up to the federal level. Um, but I think a lot of Americans now are deciding, you know, I'm just going to work and do what I can in my local space and um, see uh, what works and, and if the federal government uh, takes advantage of, of that. We've gone through periods like this in our country's history, um, so I, I assume we'll get out of it, but I'm looking to the states now. Cool. I uh, unfortunately have to draw this to a close. We've got a little bit tight on time, so I won't have time for audience questions, but I want to thank our panel for a really fascinating, albeit brief, discussion. Thank you. <laughs>